will take it up in the discussion. We have learned already from Gerd Binnick in the last um, in the last presentation where also David Kerr was speaking about Watson. Data is data, but understanding data and handling it is very complex in medicine. And Gert will speak about it. Can a machine intelligence help there? Please, Gert. So thanks, Bayat. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. I said that already, and I can only repeat that. Uh, yeah, in my first slide, actually, the railroad also shows up, like was mentioned before. So I give a very high-level picture, very simplified, what I think is, is happening right now. There were always big inventions happening over the last uh, centuries. And the railroad is, is, is a steam engine is one, when, one invention of them. And today, I think nanostructures are something that, that are extremely important and will change the world. So all these inventions somehow had a big impact on society and the lifestyle of people. And today, nanostructures, and I don't explicitly don't say nanotechnology because nanostructures is everything. That's not just the artificial nanostructures. It's all the, the natural nanostructures like, uh, like you have in biology and which we uh, understand better and better. They are as important as the as, uh, artificially built ones. Uh, the artificially built ones might have also then in a later stage also a big impact on society. Again, what I call aut uh, autonomic uh, machine networks, what people also call than the Internet of Things. That c comes probably to a much later stage, but already what is happening today is with um, the combination of nanostructures and uh, cognitive computing or complex computing, which is a little bit more intelligent than what people usually understand by uh, computing. It's more uh, involving uh, human knowledge into a computer program in an explicit uh, form. Um, that, that's the difference. But already big data uh, changes our world today uh, quite a bit, and complex computing is already involved there a lot. I mean, all these institutions collecting all kinds of data today, like Google and, and the others, will change uh, society and is already changed society. I, and it's not so sure whether that's, whether that's to our benefit or whether that's great that, that this is happening, but it's happening. And um, so, but, but when I talk about big data for healthcare, then I talk not about personal data. I talk about an anonymized uh, data and not uh, tracking sing, uh, single uh, persons. Um, and this then will have a big impact on healthcare. That maybe the, the biggest impact will be on healthcare actually. This combination of nanostructures with intelligent and more sophisticated uh, computing. Um, yeah, because uh, we can treat uh, the complexity of, uh, of humans and the, the complexity of diseases just in the appropriate way by introducing very complex uh, uh, diagnostics and treatment procedures. Otherwise, you cannot treat it. If it's complex, you have to treat it a complex way. So if you look into the history of uh, computers, in the beginning, beginning, there was more mechanical instrumentation, then it turned more and more into electronics. And lately, uh, since uh, actually something like 60 years or so, software plays more and more an important role. And uh, IBM introduced this term of com uh, cognitive uh, computing, and we introduced a definition uh, 2003, uh, new computer language, which we called uh, cognition network technology, which is a little bit related to the, the term IBM is, is using, where human knowledge plays and context-driven analysis plays an important role. So most of the data in, in our world is uh, unstructured 
and uh, and some of the data is even not accessible because it's uh, not uh, digitized. Um, and then it's not useful. I cannot be used for big, uh, big data approaches. But cognitive computing um, helps here to make those uh, data available for data mining tools that can handle then those data more, more in an intelligent way. Uh, and this is already happening today. This genomic data, this is happening. Yeah? People collect a lot of data, gene data from people, and co uh, correlate those data with clinical outcome data, and then they come up with new diagnostic uh, uh, tests and uh, treatments. That's already happening because in this domain, uh, the, the data already relatively nicely structured. It's not as complicated as if you look at text, uh, just natural text or in images where you just have pixels or voxels, um, it's much more unstructured. That, so it's more complicated to, do, uh, to go to step into big data. Uh, so I mentioned that in, in my previous talk that most of the data actually is, uh, is not digitized yet. Uh, it's uh, something like 100 petabyte, not used today and it's very relevant data because it's in these uh, tissue slides and the tissue slides is a basis for many uh, diagnostic decisions and treatment uh, decisions today. This is lost but it cha it's changing right now. People digitize more and more those data and uh, through cognitive um, computing those data can be available, uh, made available for um, big data approaches. So with uh, data, without data, you can, cannot do anything. I mean, every scientist uh, does his work based on, on data. But if you have really big data, it's also a problem. Because if, if people look at a huge amount of data, I mean, it's too much. It's just a, a huge forest and you don't see the trees anymore. Or, or the other way around. Yeah? It's, it's too complex. And, and that's why people develop these uh, techniques that can look for patterns in a huge amount of data where people just with their naked eyes or with some simple tools uh, are completely lost. Um, and then you might ask questions, can you find patterns in those data that predict, predict something, like uh, a, a treatment response of a patient? Just by looking at the data, can I foresee what will happen if I give this patient a certain treatment? And, and, and also for the probability that a cancer might recur, or questions like that. You can have many different types of questions. Just looking at the data, can you predict something? So the first step is um, uh, restructuring the data in a meaningful way. So if you just have pixels, that's not, that's, that's not good data, data because pixels have no, no meaning. You have to find objects and images, and you have to find the meaning in text and not just taking the words. That, that's not enough. And I can give you here an example that structuring is extremely helpful. Beat gave us his example <laughs> yesterday. So on the left-hand side, you see some structure. It's co a complete chaos. Everything goes uh, like hell. And you organize it in a very meaningful way. Then, then the data is structured, and you can do something with it. Yeah. I think this example shows that structuring the data in a meaningful way is also not a completely trivial task. You have to do it really in a more clever way than, than this is, has been done here. And if you do so and if you recognize patterns in, in those uh, uh, data, then it's a new way of looking uh, at the world. Yeah? So we, we are used uh, to use instruments and look at uh, the behavior of nature. Um, and, and then come up with kind of some uh, rules that, that we observe, and you might want to explain those rules by a bottom-up approach by, in, in medicine, for instance, by explaining everything by the interaction of molecules, genes and uh, the proteins, pathways, and so on. You can explain a lot. And first you observe, and then you try to explain it uh, bottom-up. But now you have a new tool where you look on very high level into a huge amount of data and observe structures you could not observe before just by looking at something. The machine does it for you, and the machine recognizes something and tells you, here is a pattern. And, and then you 
you found a new rule or new rules, but that does not mean that you know why this rule uh, is, uh, is there. You need then to go back bottom up and try to explain what you observed again. So it's always an interaction, observing something and then explaining the effects. But big data gives you the opportunity to observe something you cannot see with your naked eye. And IT is helping here a lot, or intelligent or more sophisticated analysis is, is helping here a lot. So if you do this approach and, and segment it by scales, yeah, you start with the nanometer scale where you have the, the molecules and going up uh, to the meter scale where you have a patient and, and in between you have the single cells and then the tissue that's formed by those uh, cells, then you can have all kinds of simulations and that they exist already today that are very helpful to understand what's actually going on in, in, in a human body. So what would be, without having these up initial simulations for quantum mechanical simulations of molecules and seeing how they interact with each other, that, that's ex extremely helpful for understanding what's actually going on in, in, uh, with these uh, molecules. And on the cell level you can do the same thing. And, and people are also starting now to simulate tissue by letting, for instance, the tumor grow and, and having some models involved and see, ah, oh, this model cannot work because it behaves completely strange. It does not behave like what you observe in nature. So you always can play with models and see what, what's actually happening and then learn from this. And, and the ultimate goal what would be to, to simulate a single cell and all the interactions uh, that you can have in a cell, it might, uh, you might have to wait for this something like a hundred years or so. I, I uh, assume it will take, it's, it's a long way to go. Um, and, and maybe on the patient level as well, what all these interactions between the different organs and the chemical interactions that happening, to simulate that is, is extremely complicated. So we, but we can do something uh, in between. So, and I mentioned that already, what is already happening is to connect uh, the molecules with the patient by doing the big data approach in genetics. And, and that's already working. It's working to some extent. It's not perfectly working because we all know the DNA is very far away from the phenotype. And many, many different things can happen in between and, uh, and, and what, what uh, a long way from the gene to the, to, to the proteins and from the proteins to the, to, to the phenotype. So the direct relation, one-to-one -one relation between um, uh, DNA and the patient is, is in some cases there, but not uh, often not. So you need something in between. And what you could do in between is you make a correlation between what you observe in, in, in tissue, whether you observe it uh, in a three-dimensional three form, like with a CT scan or an MRI, or in the tissue itself, and using all kinds of interesting technologies to do that, spectroscopy and all, all the different ways of uh, using markers also in, in the tissue or in, 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 the, in, in uh, CT, uh, CT scans or MRI scans. You can use all the technologies you, you like and then you correlate that with clinical outcome data. That is a new approach. That's not done yet uh, to a large extent, but it's coming and it's uh, started to, to evolve. And that then bridges the gap uh, between uh, uh, the tissue and the patient. And then at, at the next step, you can correlate um, gene expression data and protein data with all uh, these uh, phenotypes you observe and, and quantify on, on, on the tissue level. Uh, and actually, on all scales, you can do, do this big data approach and, and connect everything with every, everything. And in the end, uh, you connect all this to texts that are also available. All the people write their results into uh, scientific publications about what, what they think the proteins do, what kind of protein interactions you have, what kind of pathways you have, what kind of result comes out of, of all these different types of simulations and what you get from big data approaches. And you bring all together into one 
decision system, and I'm not sure whether that Watson can, can actually deliver this. It's uh, not what Watson is doing right now, but maybe what they will do in the future, or maybe somebody else. There are several companies in the world that talk today already about uh, this uh, uh, cl clinical decision supports, where they bring all kinds of information uh, into one system and give a recommendation to the, to the med a medical doctor. So, I think I've seen that my time is over, but I might just um, add one thing, that uh, machine intelligence is certainly very helpful in many, many different respects, and that uh, big data and machine intelligence can help us in various different ways, and one, one I mentioned a few already, and one that I have not mentioned so much is just by restructuring or structuring the data in a meaningful way, um, you can have databases where you can have a nice search, you know, nice text search, when you, you get a lot of help from that, or image search, where you get a similar case just out of the database, similar case to the case you have in front of you when you have to make a decision. So there is a lot of benefits you can get from, from cognitive computing combined uh, with data, uh, big data approaches. Oh, thank you very, very much for your attention. So questions will be asked later, I guess. Yes, I guess. Mm -hmm.